I'm going to be talking with. Um, I'm going to be talking about some joint work with um, Barbara Soda, um, Carlos Raquera, and Zach Weller Davies. Um, some of the work, most of the work I'll present, or some of the work I'll present, is available um, uh, on the archive. Um, but mostly, I'll be talking about um, some work which we'll put out um, probably very soon. Um, and ooh, is that? Okay, so, um, and I guess I really wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me to this um, meeting um, because uh, like for me, it's very time, it's a very timely meeting. Um, and that's because uh, there's a whole bunch of, uh, as, what I found very useful is to be able to talk to different people from different communities who have different perspectives, all of which have been very useful. So um, I think coming you know, more from the quantum gravity community, um, people concluded in the 50s that you had to quantize gravity and gave very general arguments about why that had to be the case. Um, and really have not looked back um, and re-examined those arguments. Um, on the other hand, you know, these quite, uh, consistent hybrid dynamics of classical and quantum systems have been known um, in the foundations community for quite some time, um, 25 years or so. Um, and so it feels like there's these different communities and it's really helpful to be able to have them talk together. And I hope that uh, this dialogue will continue. Um, it's also very timely because there's experiments coming online. Um, and I think that's getting cut off of my mind, but there'll be experiments coming online in the next say 10 years or so, um, which are actually gonna test the quantum nature of gravity. And so it's very timely um, to be doing research in this area. Um, so I'm not gonna, um, I think because of the audience, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail about the, um, about the theory. Um, I will mainly talk in very general terms and with some, just some Gedenken experiments. I'll mostly talk about some very simple Gedanken experiment and just try to get really one or two messages across. So please do interrupt me with questions if you have any. Um, I just wanna say that my motivation um, is, is more coming from the perspective of the black hole information paradox where you want that information is destroyed and it turns out that you can only have, uh, or some people at least believe that information is destroyed. And it turns out you can only really have destruction of information when you have a hybrid system that in pure quantum theory, it turns out that there are some no-go theorems which make it very difficult to have information destruction in such a case. So that's my perspective, but I think there are many perspectives. Okay, so I don't have a very strong view on whether um, we, should speak, we should treat space time classically. Um, uh, I guess I think it's possible. So I'm more just interested in exploring, exploring the consequences of that. Um, I've made some bets um, um, as to whether it could be classical because people are giving me very good odds. So um, that's my perspective. I think that I think um, I, I want to say, you know, let's explore whether space time can be classical, whether gravity can be classical. And what we find is if it can be, that there's a few really interesting consequences of that. Um, well, first we find that it actually can be, so you can construct a consistent theory of classical gravity <coughs> coupled to quantum systems. So that's possible. I think that's interesting. And if, it, if we do that, we find that it necessarily causes decoherence, uh, fundamental decoherence or collapse of the wave function. Um, it would necessarily lead to diffusion in classical degrees of freedom um, and destruction of information. And the main um, thrust of my talk, so the main key message is that it necessarily results in deco decoherence and diffusion in such a way that there's a trade-off between the amount of decoherence and the amount of diffusion and that this makes it testable. So that's the main point I think I want to make. So um, in this uh, brief talk, I'll just, just try and make three points. Um, the first is that I will go over Feynman's argument from the 50s of why we can't have a quantum system which influences a classical system. 
Um, and then I will, um, uh, uh, of course, that has a loophole, and we'll see why that argument has a loophole. And then I want to ask the question, okay, given that this loophole, what is the most general form of this dynamics? And various forms of them have been found previously. And we'll find the most general form of this dynamics. And then I'll show that, or just at least tell you, um, without giving you the proof, that one can formally prove that there is necessarily a trade-off between decoherence and diffusion in any hybrid system. So not just gravity, but any hybrid system needs to have decoherence and diffusion, and there's a trade-off between these two things, and that's experimentally testable. Is any question about maybe just the main, just what the topic I'll be cover, I'll cover is? Okay. So let's just ask first the question, can we consistently couple quantum systems and classical systems? Is it at all possible? Um, and the no-go argument um, dates back to Feynman in the 50s, but there's um, more modern versions due to Yakir Aronoff and, and various other versions. Um, so I'll give the, um, the kind of very simple thought experiment, which is imagine I'm doing, um, I imagine a lot of you have seen this before, but I, I will just um, give it anyway. Um, and please ask me if you have any questions. We're just doing a simple two-slit experiment, so an interference experiment. We put, say, a massive object or an electron. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's what we want is that it's a quantum particle which can go through, um, go through either slit, and um, we want that it interacts with some classical field. And the argument due to Feynman and Aronov is that if the field that it interacts with is classical, then we can measure this field exactly. We can, because classical systems you can measure exactly. And so you can measure the classical field exactly. And if you can measure the classical field exactly, you can tell which slit it went through. And if you can tell which slit it went through, then there will not be an interference pattern. So the argument of Feynman and Aronov is that you can't couple quantum systems with classical ones. At least you can't have the quantum system affect the classical system. Because if you did, then if you had a superposition, it would need to collapse right away because you could use the classical system to determine which split the particle went through. Is there any question about that thought experiment? Because I think that's the key. Yeah, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Uh, so this is assuming unitarity, right? Because, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So it's assuming yeah, that the back reaction is, uh, and, and that, and you and you put your finger on the um, kind of key assumption that they assumed that um, you know that the particle pushes onto the classical field, but they assumed that it did it in a deterministic way. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions about the thought experiment? Yeah, to, to be honest, sorry, I didn't understand that. Uh, so what, what are the conditions? The classical field will get disturbed by, by the particle going through the slit and 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 so this information. That just like yeah. electromagnetism, the field has to be in a different state depending on where the particle is. Yeah. So, so I could learn which slit it went through, but but isn't that classical field just decohering that signal through the back it, action in some way? Exactly, but the point is that it has to do it right away. You know, the, because you can, unlike a quantum field, which has an uncertainty relation. So if it was a quantum field, you wouldn't be able, even though the, the quant, you know, for electromagnetic field, the electromagnetic field, if you can see here, you know, here is the particle going here's the moon actually, here the moon goes through the light, right slit or the left slit, it gets entangled with the field, EL or ER. And yeah. if it gets entangled with this quantum field, then that's okay. It doesn't lead to instantaneous collapse because we can't really tell the electromagnetic field apart depending on, you know, we can't determine EL or ER, we can't measure it exactly because it obeys an uncertainty mm -hmm. principle. You can have, um, you know, you can have quantum states which are different, like e, the quantum state of the electromagnetic field, depending on whether the moon went through the left or the right slit, 
that quantum field is not orthogonal, but it has a large area. Yeah. Whereas a classical field, you cannot have two distinct classical states, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. are not, cannot be you know, distinguished exactly. So that's the argument that a classical field, you can measure it exactly. And therefore, if the classical field is in two different states, depending on whether the moon went through the left or the right slit, you could measure it exactly. And so things would have to collapse instantaneously if you couple a quantum system to a classical system. That's the argument. So, so is it somehow related to, to non-cloning via non-distinguishability? Because it's essentially some sort of distinguishability argument, right? So yeah, the if, argument if is I that could, you know, in quantum yeah. in quantum mechanics, the quantum field, the electromagnetic field, um, you know, we can't distinguish it. Yeah. Classical yeah. field, we can distinguish it. Yep. Because in some sense, a classical you know system we can measure we can measure it as many times as we want. We don't disturb it. It's more of an uncertainty yeah, exactly. so, thing. We can, but they're related, of course. We can measure this classical field as accurately as we want to determine exactly which that the moon went through, and therefore we'll have instantaneous decoherence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So the uh, the key uh, assumption of Feynman and Aharonov was that uh, the classical system is deterministic and exactly. you can measure it exactly in the sharper sense. Exactly. That, that uh, is the key assumption that forbids the, the coupling. Uh, exactly. exactly. Uh, to the, uh, uh, between the classical and the quantum. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so as as um, both Leosh and uh, Doyle have uh, have indicated, the, their their key assumption is that um, the evolution is deterministic. But if it's stochastic, um, in other words, if the quantum particle um, doesn't create a particular state, but rather creates some probabilistic, you know, states with different probabilities. So here, for example imagine that the state of the gravitational field is some Gaussian depending on the uh, whether the particle went through the left or the right slit, then you, know, you cannot measure the, in, in that sense, measuring the gravitational field does not tell you with certainty which slit the moon went through. All right, so that's the key point that you need to have diffusion in the, you need to have some stochasticity in the gravitational system. Um, and the, the key point, and I, I'm not the first to, so, so I, as we'll see, other people have noticed this in, in various hybrid theories, the key point, um, so the, the, the point I'm, I'm going to make is not so much that, but this is, I'm not gonna say anything, in most of my talk, I will not be saying anything new, um, but the, the main point is that um, this fact that you need diffusion and decoherence, one can rigorously prove um, that any theory, no matter which theory you give me, which is a classical quantum hybrid theory, as long as it's a fundamental you know, valid theory, it necessarily leads to either a lot of classical diffusion and irreversibility um, or a lot of quantum decoherence. Um, so in some sense, it answers a question that Lej was asking me at one of the breaks whether you know is this is this irreversibility absolutely necessary, um, and the answer is yes, it's absolutely necessary. You simply cannot have a hybrid theory of any two systems in which you don't have this stochasticity and irreversibility along with decoherence. Are there any questions? Because that's actually, um, I'm even going to put a little kapow signs around it. That is really the only point I want to make in this talk. Um, um, just that you can make a general theorem which tells you how much decoherence and how much diffusion you need in order to make any hybrid theory consistent. Maybe just a minor comment. Um, I, I agree with you that if you want to develop a, a consistent measurement theory, irreversibility has to be there. 
uh, now um, in in so you I'm sure you know well you know about measurement theory way better than me but in the in the old papers by Perez, um, I was um, intrigued by the idea of splitting the measurement process into a pre measurement and a measurement. Mm -hmm. So the pre measurement is a unitary process on top of which the irreversibility of the actual measurement uh, plays the final role. So, um, so I just wanted to make that comment and see if you agree with this perspective or not. Um, so certainly, so I, I don't think it's relevant for this, for what I'm saying um, in this talk at least, in the sense that I've used the language of measuring the gravitational field in order to determine which um, slit the moon goes through. Um, I've used that language, but it's irrelevant whether I actually perform the measurement or not. Um, you know, there's just something, as you say, I mean, I, I think I'm agreeing with you, as you say, there is simply, a, a, you can think of the interaction as the pre-measurement step, right? The, the coupling is some interaction which, you know, in some sense correlates the slit that the moon went through with the gravitational field. That's just some interaction. I don't need, whether I actually perform the measurement or later is really irrelevant to this question of, of whether the dynamics is, in, is valid or not. So I use the language of measurement, but here we don't need to actually ever perform the measurement. Any other questions? Because this yeah. is actually the key, this is the, I'm happy not to, play with big equations, this is actually the key point. So I'm happy to take more questions. May I ask you a quick question about the um, slide you showed before. When you talk about diffusion, you also mean that there's a distribution associated by the to the classical sector and that uh, this can become bimodal after the interaction, like this here. So this can be com combined. And here you have a, a bimodal distribution. That is, there's a probability that... That's right. That, that is the the main point here that this yeah, has to that be possible. the main point that there needs to be some diffusion in the classical degrees of freedom yeah. mm -hmm. and there needs to be some decoherence in the quantum degrees of freedom yeah and there is a trade-off the le if you don't have any diffusion like this deterministic theory that is considered by Feynman and Aronoff then you instantly collapse the state of the spin or the you know which story went through instantly collapse you can't get any interference yeah, I mean, On the other hand, if you make the diffusion to be huge, you know, then you can, um, then you can get some, um, uh, uh, then you then you can get some coherence. But there's a trade-off. Yeah, thanks. It's, I'm very much in agreement with with this view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I, then I'm, I want to emphasize: I'm not saying anything that other people hadn't noticed before. So Leo, uh, I think, was the first person to point this out in his model. Um, I think the only thing I'm saying in this talk is that you can prove general theorems which tell you that any hybrid classical quantum system have to experience this trade-off. So it's a general feature of any theory, not just the ones that you know people have given examples of. Ten minutes, including. May, may, may I, may I uh, waste a minute of, of your talk again? Um, do, you, do you want to, um, I suspect it, yes. it may be easier because you know all this. Um, I, I, I want to make a, a general remark. Uh, okay, I, but I, will namely, get to, I think I will get to more details where it may be more relevant for that remark. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't mean any, any, any more deeper uh, uh, details. Okay. I'm only curious how we shall get around with the uh, explicit discrepancy between uh, your and uh, your statement which i agree with that uh, the coupling cannot be uh, reversible mm -hmm. so you 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 have to uh, cope with the decurrence and diffusion uh, on one hand and the so many different uh, formalisms uh, we learned about during the, the workshop, which do not seem to include any irreversibility in their uh, 
quantum classical dynamics. I mean the the Koopman uh, uh, stuff. I mean uh, the the uh, the phase space uh, uh, the the unifications, which are based on the phase space formalism. So they yeah. do I not mention any that, any. I would be happy to discuss that at the end, if that's okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I will just remark when I put up the slide that, you know, I think there are, you know, different. So I think if you say a quantum chemist, for example, you might not. So we're going to demand that this is a, is a consistent dynamics where you everything is completely positive trace preserving. If you're a quantum chemist, then you might just believe that you, you only presumably care about an effective theory, for example, where one system is effectively classical not that it's actually classical. And if you only care about this as an effective theory, then you might not care about complete positivity. Um, and so then you might be okay as long as you can make the correct predictions, you may be okay with it. But let's save this for the discussion. Yeah. I, I do think it's a challenge for any formalism, which you know, I think it's a challenge that, it, I guess what I, I will show a general form of the dynamics that is allowable. So I'll show that there's the most general form you can possibly have. And what it means is that if any other approach is a valid dynamics in the sense of it being linear and completely positive trace preserving, then it must be, it must fall into the category of the dynamics I will write down. So I will write down the most general dynamics and I would say that anything which doesn't fit into this category cannot be considered a valid consistent dynamics, but it may be good enough for your quantum chemistry experiment, for example, if you just care about averages or something like that. Okay, so, so there's the argument and I think we all agree I think we agree that we need some decoherence and diffusion. So let me now turn to another reason why people in gravity, and I, I think for this audience, I don't really need to say much about this. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna have to just go very quickly. I, I, will, I was gonna say why we want a linear theory and why we can't look at averages, and I'm not gonna do that given the time. I will just say the following. I mean, this maybe partially answers Diyashi's question, but I think also poses a challenge to people that do other um, formalisms, which is that the object of interest for me is the um, is a quantum system at each point in phase space. So I have, you know, so what is a classical, what is a hybrid object? Well, fundamentally, the thing you need to compute is a you know, I, I, have a, I have a phase space and at each point I have a density matrix. So the system, uh, so you can think of it, for example, like here's the hybrid qubit. Um, it's a two by two matrix, but the matrix is a function of phase space. Or if I'm a mathematician, it's a fiber over a symplectic matrix, all right? So it clearly needs to be completely positive. The dynamics has to be completely positive or I get negative probabilities. Um, and it has to be uh, norm preserving. So that's what I'm demanding of my dynamics. And that clearly is the minimal requirement. So I'm gonna, um, it's clearly the minimal requirement. And if you, uh, also, if you wanna think about it, what a, a hybrid object is, you can think of it like this, where I can embed it in a quantum system and I just make sure that the system, the state of the system is always diagonal in the class of the scale. So, um, you know, I, 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 the reason I'm so happy about this conference is that I spent a lot of time, you know, rederiving things which have already been known. Um, the, the, the valid dynamics has been known since 94, 95. Um, so this is um, a particular diagonal um, master equation, which is a valid classical quantum dynamics by Blanchard and Yazik, um, Liosh, um, um, has a continuous version, and I think he's the he, you know, and he wrote a continuous master equation which had which had the this Alexandrov Gerasimov bracket, but then in addition to this bracket, the, I guess you call it the quantum Liouville equation. He also added some diffusion in the classical phase space. 
and he added some decoherence and he noted that they had to satisfy the formation. Um, and his, his model works for, as he, as he said in this talk, interactions of this form. Um, and what I wanted, the only thing I really want to say here is that this is a general feature of all hybrid dynamics. And in fact, the only continuous dynamic, you can, they ended up, ended up being dividing, dividing into two categories. One, which is a, you know, a generalization of the one that Diyoshi had and one which has discrete and finite size jumps in phase space. So um, this is the most general form of the dynamics you can have. This is the most general super operator you can have, classical quantum super operator. And the continuous version, there's only one continuous dynamic. It's a slight generation, generalization, a very modest one of Diyoshi's. And um, it obeys a slightly, so these are, what you have is a kind of a Fokker-Planck equation in phase space. You have this thing, which is a slight, you know, can include friction, but is roughly speaking a generalization of the Garamasov, sorry, Alexandrov, Garamasov, I apologize, bracket. Um, and then you have the Lindbladian term. And these are big matrices when you have many degrees of freedom and they have to obey this equation, but you can see that when they're not matrices, they will obey, it's simply the trade-off that Leosh had in his 95 paper. So if you look at this, the stronger the interaction, that's D1, so let me... Oh. One minute. One minute. So you can just see from here, if, the, if D1 is the strength of the interaction, so if it's very strong, and if the decoherence is very small, then this just means that, that this matrix has to be positive semi-definite as do all the individual matrices. It just means that the diffusion has to be very large. All right. Um, and as I said, this has been noticed by uh, a few, uh, you know, this, this uh, so I think, um, I just want to mention a few references. Um, this has been kind of appeared in other models before, um, and all we're really showing is that it's a very general thing. Um, and now we're just going to apply it to gravity. Um, and I think for us, that's the exciting thing. So we can use this trade off between decoherence and diffusion to actually test whether gravity is quantum or not. And it offends, it, essentially, it means that things are. You know, between a rock and a hard place. Either you have very strong gravitational decoherence of superpositions, and we can test that in the lab, um, and we're really butting up against that limit already. Um, and if you don't have, um, if if you don't have very strong gravitational induced decoherence, then you must have a lot of gravitational diffusion. So diffusion in the, in some sense, the kinetic energy of the gravitational field, and that you can actually observe on astrophysical scales. So we put in some numbers. I, um, it's because it's subtle. I, I um, maybe can discuss this at a later point. But event, essentially, you get diffusion in the gravitational kinetic energy, which should be observable on astrophysical scales. Um, and that just comes about because the gravitation induced decoherence is not that large. What do you call gravitational kinetic energy? It's not very clear to me. Um, it's the, so if you, well, okay, so it doesn't exist in Newtonian gravity because we live in static, in some sense, we think of static space time. Um, but it's the conjugate to, so if you think of the Newtonian field as being a, phase-based degree of freedom, then it has a conjugate degree of freedom, which is just the momentum. So you get fluctuations in the gravitate, the Newtonian potential, and that's like a kinetic energy. It's a gravitational kinetic energy. So it doesn't, it's not something which you see in the Newtonian theory, but in any, it's, it's a natural consequence of um, any classical quantum coupling that you will have to have some diffusion in the metric. In a, a general relativistic theory, it's very clear what it means because we have gravitational kinetic energy. So if you go to the, you know, I won't present this here, but you go to the ADM formalism, 
for gravity, you can get a, um, you know, you can write down the gravitational Hamiltonian that has kinetic energy, and that's where you see the thing. But the observant, you know, but um, the, 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 so the, the important part, I think, is that if you have, so here's the, the relation we get, the fundamental relation we get. So the diffusion in, you can think of it as the conjugate to the Newtonian potential has to be larger than the, deco, you know, there's a, there's a one over the decoherence rate of matter in superposition. So you can, you can get this number here from experiments and then put a lower bound on how much diffusion you have to have in the gravitational field. And that's experimentally testable. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe we'll leave uh, more discussions and questions uh, at the break. Uh, I also have a comment, but <laughs> uh, restrain myself until the break. So okay. let's Could thank. Oh, somebody, okay, just please. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, and I, I'll wait after the break. I'm happy to go in, I'll go into the, uh, I'll either stay here or go into the networking room after for questions. But the, the basic idea is you, if you just assume space time is classical, then you necessarily have fundamental decoherence and confusion, a diffusion, sorry. There's necessarily a trade off. It's experimentally testable. And I think what's interesting, especially, for, you know, for maybe this section where there's a few people doing GR. I think there's a question of whether you could use such a theory as an effective theory to study semi-classical gravity. So yeah, thanks for your time.